lose your nerve, for only you can help me. I've had a serious accident, but I'm not in danger at the moment, although it's a matter of life or death. Andre! It's, it, it's no good calling to me or saying anything. I can't answer. I can't speak. You've got to do exactly and very carefully what I tell you. When you knock, I'll open the door. Walk over to my desk and put the milk on it. Then go into the other lab and try to find a fly. A fly. You'll be all right now. I know it's worth it! <laughs> Hey everyone, welcome to part one of our Halloween build, where we are going to be starting work with the fly. Now if you remember, I was tossing back and forth with the fly and the faceless man. Um, not saying I'm not going to do the faceless man, but I am decided to start with this kit. Now if you're just joining us for the first time on this build, what we're doing is we're building the fly from the 1958 movie. Um, with Vincent Price. Um, now, there is no fly kit out there. Um, what we are doing is we are taking the um, originally Aurora, but in this case we're doing the Mobius Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, and we found some resin parts online, garage kit parts, lack of a better word, um, and we are going to use those parts to create the fly. Um, so it's going to be a combination of styrene and resin. Um, unlike, it seems to be a lot of people out there have commented on the videos and pictures I've been posting. Um, everybody seems to have built this kit at one time or another, the, the Dr. Jekyll kit. And for, that's for good reason, because it's been around since about 1968, which is, well, the year I was born. So there's a lot of people between then and now that have had plenty of time to build this in all its different iterations from Aurora to Repop Aurora to Aurora um, and again working its way now to Mobius models. Um, the kit is actually fairly simple. I was surprised it's the first time I'm seeing it. It's about 40 some odd parts in the kit um, but a lot of that is um, vials of uh, you know stuff to make the the room scene so you've got the bench the table and you've got his chemical um, uh, beakers and stuff like that 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 also comes with it um, it also comes with an assortment of um, optional glow-in-the-dark parts so you can make your Dr. Jekyll glow-in-the-dark if you so choose uh, so this is the base of our build um, we're not going to be using all those parts so right now we just started with his legs and his torso. Um, the legs came in two different parts, a front and a back, um, as you can see here in the directions of here by my thumb. Okay, you put the two parts together um, and then you add also two parts each for his shoes down here. And then it's funny, it kind of looks like a bib in a way, but you got the front of his shirt. The reason it's not a full upper torso is because most of the body would be covered by his lab coat, which in this case comes in three parts, a back, a left, and a right. Okay. Now I got to say, um, I'm assuming that this kit has actually been um, retooled over the years because I find it hard to believe that the original Aurora kit is this well made. And what I'm talking about here is one of the biggest problem with that I found with figure kits is the seams. When you put the parts together, when you put the parts together, you know, the, there's always something that doesn't fit right and that, you know, you may have waves and stuff like that in the parts because you're trying to get them to uh, two flat surfaces to made up. But here's the neat thing about this kit. See if I can get you to zoom in on this and check this out. Instead of having just a completely flat surface that you're going to meet to. See how it's got the step here? Okay, you got this and here. This is actually your gluing surface right here. So the other part 
has a very similar focus. Focus. Back out, back in. Oh, it doesn't want to focus, I'm sorry. But anyway, this has got an opposite step. So when you take your parts, line up the pinholes, those surfaces match up really well. Okay? So you got a little faint seam line. So that's really kind of neat. And that's the way the legs were, so it made it work really well with the legs. Um, <clears throat> There, um, there was some seams that still had to be done. The, the step, the, the step on a lab coat is really smooth, so I think that's going to go a lot easier. But there was a little bit of stepping when it came to the seam along his legs. Not so much here, but on the insides was really, really bad. Um, so I set to work on those and on the outside also. I'm not overly concerned about this seam also because as most of us know for those of us that wear pants your pants have a natural seam down the inside and the outside leg so if there is some seam work I'm okay with that I'm, I honestly am I'm just trying to take it down so it's not glaring the the seams on the inside of his legs were very very glaring and not to mention when his coats comes down it's going to cover quite a bit of it too, so I don't have to go crazy on the uppers. Um, pretty much just the lower stuff. Um, I put his shoes on, did some seam work on just the toes. Um, pretty much sanding that just made it go away. We'll get a better feel when I do some primer work on it. Um, that's pretty much it for that. Um, you know, the, the top glued in. Um, working with the seams um, with a figure kit, well, it, the seams can be very tricky. Okay? What I'm getting at is um, you want the contour of, in this case, the leg, to maintain its its shape. You want to have that, that wrap around. You don't you don't want that step there it's obviously you can't do that and what happens is you want to take that down so if you get some sandpaper just a little piece of um, your garden variety sandpaper and you put your thumb against it and you start sanding your thumb is soft okay and you're not going to get a lot of pressure I mean you need a pressure but it's going to conform to it's going to take you forever working and working to get that seam down what I've seen other people do, and this doesn't mean that everyone else is wrong and this is the only way to do it. By no means. That's not what I'm saying. This is what I found works for me. Some of the tools that I find very handy when working with figures or modeling in general is these um, jeweler files. They come in different shapes. This is a flat paddle. Um, this one's got a flat back with a pointed, almost like a pyramid um, type feel to it. You've got the round rat saw. You've got all different shapes, and they're very convenient for using. Okay, and they're very hard. So what I'm getting at is some, you need to apply an amount of pressure here in order to make that seam go away. So a flat one would be good, and you can go to town on it. The problem is, is this is so hard, what I've found in the past, and I've seen on other builds. Those other builds are my builds, not anyone else's is that when you're done and that seam is gone, next thing you know you have, it's not a natural rounding or curve to the leg, it's a curve and then a flat spot. And then it continues its curve. So I may use this to start taking down the, the bulk of the, um, the step in this case. And I'll use that, but once I start getting close in place, what I'll end up doing is I have a twofold thing. There's these metal files that um, the owner of my hobby shop had given me a handful before they closed. It's got some different grits on it. It's wrapped in metal. Okay, So even though it's flexible, you can flex this and get into different spots. And it's very thin. So actually, when you can do parts in between his legs here, you can get in there pretty good. Okay, you have that option. 
or what I really like to use, these are like my favorites now, these. This sanding stick has got, I got it at Hobby Lobby. I'm sure you can get it at any kind of craft store. So that would mean Michael's or probably your, um, whatever's in your area. My area, I have Michael's and Hobby Lobby. Um, it comes in a bag, I think there's about 15 or so of these in it. And each stick has got two grits on it. Okay, so these have become my favorites because they've got just enough body to it, some pressure, and then flexibility at the same time. And so once I get it close, I'll take out these suckers, and they got different grits, okay? Um, I think I've got three bags that are all, so that's six different grits. And then I start doing it with that, and this it allows me to keep the contour going, It'll follow the contour of the of the model, and it won't um, usually won't leave a flat spot. So that's um, my little tip. These are very handy if you can get these metal ones. I don't even know what they call. He just had them in a like a pencil container, and he just gave me a handful of them. Um, they're kind of cool. Um, again, the diamond files are another thing that are really good, and in some instances also. What works very well is these. These are these um, sanding needles. Okay, so these are kind of cool too. They don't last very long. Um, I think it has to do with the way the material that they use for the sanding is adhered to the stick, that it just doesn't last very long. But at the very end of it, down by my finger here, there is a flat surface, and you've got the round tube. You can use all that. And then you've got a, a very sharp point that you can really get into. Oops, be a very sharp point you can get into some really tight areas with. I find these very useful in areas like this. If you can see this here, there's um, the crease from his knee joint. So this one works really good. I can get in here and I can clean out anything that's been in there when it comes to either just a bare seam. Or if I've used filler on it, I can, you know, starts to catch in these these uh, low spots and fills in. Well, this get in here with this, and this really, after a little bit of effort, will clean it out, and you still retain your crease. Okay, so that's pretty cool. So that's where we are right now. We got the legs, the feet, and the the first shirt done. Um, I'm going to also start working on the jacket. It's three parts like I showed you. I'm going to glue that together, let it dry, work on the sanding. But before I put the jacket on him, okay, which as you can see, it's going to cover that much of his bottom. Okay, and then you can see here how much of his leg, his thigh is going to cover. But I don't want to leave this unpainted, and if I put this on and then try to paint, it's going to be near impossible. So most likely what's going to happen is while I work on this, I can start painting this and get this part ready um, for the jacket. So, um, so we have this ready. We have the jacket that's going to be next. And then we also have to prep the resin parts um, for this build and uh, we'll get that to that next so hang on we'll be right back hey guys welcome back um, just want to take a moment before we get too far into the build and talk about our resin parts um, we're gonna get them ready for paint and such and um, you know some people may not have worked with resin before um, some people may be hesitant about it, so I thought it'd be a good idea to show you um, some of the differences and, and how to handle it. Because again, it's not your normal um, medium that a lot of people are used to. So I figured just give you a quick tip. For the most part, it's really no different than working with styrene. I mean, I, I did a video about a year or so ago about washing your kit parts. Um, and you want to do that with resin too, for all the same reasons. Um, sure, the styrene kits are styrene, they have a mold and everything, and they still have some sort of release agent that they use to pop them out of their molds. Well, resin parts are the same way. 
Um, I'm not sure about the mechanics and the process of it all, but I know it can be a little, it's, it's sometimes a little different. And when you have parts like this, now this is a big piece of resin here and it's got a lot of detail in it. Um, granted, it's just crack, cracks and cran cracks and crannies. Um, yeah, it's, he's a big English muffin. Um, but anyway, um, there's a lot of parts in here, a lot of pieces where the mold will get stuck, could get stuck to it. So I'm sure a big piece like that, they use lots of mold agent. And whatever the chemical is, it does stay on the figure. And it can stay there. I've heard stories of people having a figure that was many years old and when they went to paint it, they had issues because of the mold release was still there. So um, even though I sometimes shortchange myself when it comes to washing my kit parts, um, I'll be sure that I don't make that mistake with resin. I will always do that. So what I do is I got this little bucket, a little tote here, um, as you can see, filled with some warm water, um, soapy water. Not hot water, because hot water, um, like it does with styrene, it will cause it to flex a little bit. Um, you don't want to warp anything. I just use just a, a tepid, tepid water, okay? Um, pour a little, uh, some people, a lot of people use Dawn. You know, Dawn takes grease out of your way. Um, I happen to use Ajax because it guarantees it'll remove grease. Um, but anyway, you take the parts, you put them in your water, you, you can wash them around a little bit. And what I do is I have this old toothbrush. Yes, I have a Thor toothbrush. Um, battery's dead in, it doesn't really work, it's not the point. But what I'll do is I'll just take this brush and I will give him a really good, <laughs> that tickles, huh? I'll give him a really good brushing. And the idea again is just to get everything clean and release free. Um, don't want to go too hard because I don't know how much pressure it would take to actually start um, eroding the resin. I, I've, I'm not really a big resin person. Um, I've only worked with it in little bits and pieces. These here are the biggest pieces that I've ever worked with. So you're going to wash your parts and then all you're going to do is, I, I, you know, when I'm done with them, um, take them, put them on the uh, paper towel next to me there, um, and let them air dry. You know, if you're in a rush, you can always, you know, you can blot them dry, maybe use uh, some light air or something like that from a hair dryer. Again, not high heat, but just to get the moisture out of it. Um, but that's really all you have to do. Um, and once this is all dry, thoroughly dried off and cleaned, um, we'll be able to go on to the next part of this, which is going to be removing the excess part and cleaning it up. Um, you know, resin parts aren't um, usually perfectly cut to fit like your styrene parts are. Um, you know, for example, on this part here, I don't want to dwell too much on it, we'll get to it later, but in this part here, as you can see, the actual part ends here at the, cl the cleft. This is his, his sleeve. He's got his sleeve rolled up, and this part here is just excess. This here has to come off. All this is just extra resin. See, I get extra resin for my money. Okay, um, another example would be, where is it? Um, where the heck was it? Oh yeah, on this piece here. Again, this right here is where the part ends and this is just an extra, a little bit of resin. Okay, so in order for this to mate properly to this, both parts have to be trimmed off into a nice smooth flat surface and then they'll be glued in place. So that's it for right now. Let me get these parts um, washed and dried and then uh, we'll be on to the next step. Right back.